Good morning, Cornerstone Bible Church. My name is Pastor James. I'm the associate pastor here for those of you who are new or joining us online today. Know that uh, the elder board is working hard so that we can meet again, and we will be making an announcement on that uh, when we might possibly be meeting here in the next week or so. So just be staying tuned for that. We are trying to do all we can to be diligent and comply with the guidelines that our government has laid out for us because we do want to still be good examples and good stewards of what God has given us so that we can be light and a good example as well in this community. Uh, also, if you looked at your announcements or saw those online, we want to say, number one, again, congratulations, seniors. You did it, and God has got great things for you. So we couldn't be more uh, blessed and happy to know all that you've accomplished and all that you will accomplish. Also, if you would like to serve, or even if you still need some, or if you know someone who needs help or needs something, if you go to our website, which you're probably already here, <laughs> uh, cb.church, and if you go to the top and you select serve or ministries, you'll go to serve. And in there, there are some forms that you can fill out if you would like to serve on a ministry team or if you know someone in need as well. Also, for the younger uh, students, or anyway from uh, birth really through high school, we do have a website and a Facebook page called Lego Club Gothenburg. And we are starting to get a lot of interest in our community, and it's been great. Please check that out. Go to Facebook. Lego Club Gothenburg. There is a link if you go to our main web, our Facebook page and type in Lego Club Gothenburg, you should be able to find it. And what's happening is each week there is a different competition and we are really trying to get the word out. So if you know people in your neighborhood or community or uh, just friends or family who have kids anywhere from, you know, again, from birth all the way through high school, have them go online to Facebook see that week's competition, and have them build something for fun during this time. And we're starting to, again, pick up traction with a lot of, a lot of different and great creative ways to have fun during this time. And each of those winners gets a little Lego set, so it's kind of fun. Also, um, we just still do have Zoom conferencing. If that is something that you need uh, for your Bible studies or uh, groups or whatever that's meeting for our church, please let Sherry know. At the office, you can contact her at office at cb.church. And um, other than that, your tithes and offerings can still be done online now. You can send those in or you can send them up through bill pay. Uh, just as you give as the Lord leads. And we just do appreciate. Thank you for continuing to give. Uh, your generosity is greatly appreciated. Uh, we can't continue to do ministry without those, and we know that you are giving as an act of serving God. So I just want to say, on behalf of our church, thank you for sacrificing your tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day, and thank you that we are seeing our country slowly come back uh, from this pandemic and, and move into ways that we can begin to engage with one another um, without so many restrictions, Lord. And we do look forward to that time when, when all these restrictions are lifted and we go back to whatever the new normal is, Lord, whatever that looks like. And as Pastor Scott is going to be sharing today, Lord, in Romans 14, I'm just reminded how we are to treat one another, especially our brothers and sisters. Lord, without that judgment, without that contempt, we are to see each one as a brother and sister in Christ, whom you've created and whom they serve you. Help us to remember those things. Lord, I am so thankful for all that you are doing. Continue to work in our lives in such a way that we are great examples of your love. We give you glory and honor. 
May you bless this time. May you give Scott wisdom and discernment and words that give grace to those who hear it. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Cornerstone. Thank you for joining us uh, yet again on another Sunday online. We just appreciate you uh, uh, making it a point of gathering together virtually as we seek to uh, worship our Lord with one another as a church body. Um, we are in the midst of a serious book of Romans, if you're joining us just now. And uh, what a treasure it's been to, to uh, look at this wonderful, wonderful book of the Bible. Uh, would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for the privilege it is today to open your word. We pray that you would be honored and glorified. I pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, teach us. Thank you that he's inside of us. I pray that uh, we would listen to him, take to heart what you'd have us to hear as we present our whole walking around self to you, consecrated followers of Jesus. Father, I pray for those that are watching today that perhaps they haven't come to know Christ as their personal Savior. Maybe they're asking questions. Maybe they're wondering. Maybe they're dead set against Christ. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in a 
just a unique and special way in their life, open their eyes, the eyes of their heart, so that they can see what is the hope of our calling in Christ Jesus. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. There's a common saying in the first century, and it was this, that all roads lead to Rome. The ancient city was an intersection of numerous cultures and beliefs. And as it was supposed to, the church reflected that diversity. Romans, then, is a letter to the church in Rome filled with very different people from very different backgrounds, religious beliefs, and practices. And it tells us about the incredible grace of God that has forgiven us, though we have rebelled against our Creator. He has chosen to adopt us into His family, making us His very own. He puts His Holy Spirit inside of us, and from inside of us, transforms us inside out, not demanding that we fit in conformity to some external image, but instead that we grow and mature and become Christ-like inside of us. It's a beautiful truth. That is what Peter later calls our like precious faith. And I love that phrase, our like precious faith. The, that's the first part of Romans. The, from chapter 12 on, many practical applications emerge. Paul tells us in the first 12, 11 chapters about our like precious faith, of why we do not need to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, why we should value it above everything else, why we should consecrate ourselves fully to Him. And then everything that follows, chapter 12 on, are practical applications. And the majority of those practical applications only take Paul a few sentences to share. In fact, some of them are just half sentences. At points we even have lists. But in Romans chapter 14, through the first half of chapter 15, he gets to a practical application which will take him a chapter and a half to explain. What do you think? Do you think maybe there was a problem in the church he was addressing? I think so. Will you stand with me? as we open our Bible to Romans 14, verses 1 through 12, and let's read God's Word together. Actually, what I want to do is start with chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll skip to chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. The reason for that is because Romans 12, 1 and 2 is, a, is an overarching truth that everything after it uh, comes from. So Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore I urge you, brethren, uh, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now skip with me to chapter 14 and we'll look at verses 1 through 12 this morning. He goes on to say, Now, in light of consecrating your whole walking around self to Christ, now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. <clears throat> who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And then in verse 5, one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself. Not one dies for himself. For if we live, 
We live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And for this sin, Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord, both of the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Oh, what a powerful passage of Scripture. You may be seated. You know, many years ago, Internet dating sites emerged as the internet became popular. And it became common for them to advertise programs that were supposed to be even better than the other sites at interviewing applicants and matching them to a date on the basis of common interests. Uh, well, I got to tell you, I, my wife and I, if we were to take one of those tests, I don't think we would ever be a match. The fact is, we are two very, very different people. We often have different opinions. We often want to do different things and have different delights and enjoyments. Yet we enjoy a wonderfully close and rewarding marriage because we share in common a like precious faith. My brother-in-law is one of my best friends and the two of us are very different people. Our jobs are different. Our personalities, our hobbies are different. Yet we enjoy our time together. We end up talking about the Bible, about church life, about doctrine, about being a Christian man, husband and dad. We share in common like precious faith. Cornerstone Bible Church you and I are filled with people very different one from another. Yet how we miss each other right now. Our reactions to the pandemic has been widely diverse. Our opinions are dramatically different. And quite frankly, held with really strong emotions. But as we approach the light at the end of the tunnel... How can, how can we ensure that our different opinions and understandably strong emotions do not result in division, hurt feelings, and unresolved offenses that linger beyond the lockdown? Romans chapters 14 and 15 through the first half to chapter 15 gives us several principles to guide us when we disagree. And the first of those principles in, in the verses 1 through 12 of Romans 14. And we'll call this the judgment principle. Which basically says this. Do not judge each other's motives. That's God's job. In essence, that's what we are told in verses 1 through 12. We are also told that there are some that are weak and that are some that are strong. And those who are strong in faith support the weak. There are three things we have in common when we experience conflict, when we disagree over opinion with others. And then there is a treasure that is of such immense value that it puts our disagreements into perspective. And the first thing that you and I have in common when we experience disagreement is that we all have an opinion. We all have opinions. And sometimes those opinions vary. Looking in with me at verses 1 through 4 of Romans 14, it says, Except the one who is weak in faith, not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that it's not okay to eat certain things and, or that he can eat certain things and somebody else has the opposite view. And then he goes through that verse with just that same thing. And then he says this, not to judge one another. God has accepted the person you disagree with. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Both the Jewish faith and the Greco-Roman traditions put heavy emotions 
or heavy emphasis on food and holy days. Jews were bound by the dietary restrictions of the Mosaic Code and celebrated feast days, as well as practiced strict Sabbath laws. The Romans were raised to believe in multiple gods, and they built their calendar around their top deities. It was common practice for them to sacrifice their meat to their gods before they ate it. And sometimes the meat that had been offered on an altar in a temple to, a, to one of their gods and then sold in the marketplace at a discounted rate. All that became issues of disagreement for these early believers. Now, you and I may have a hard time relating to that and understanding all of it, but if you stop and you really think through it, you know, it's not as if we don't have disagreements over our opinions that a later generation is going to look back on and think, how do they ever disagree about that? We have different opinions. And there were some who had walked with the Lord long enough to know that they were free from the Mosaic dietary laws. These Jewish believers come to know Christ and, and saw the freedom that grace gave them. And then there were also <clears throat> believers who had been saved for some time out of paganism, <clears throat> the worship of false gods, and they knew that because those false gods are not real, who cares if you eat the meat that's been offered to them or not? What difference does it matter? But still probably many in that church of Rome were young believers. It was a youngish church. And were not as mature in Christ. And out of a sincere heart, they want to please God. And so these are significant questions to them. So Paul says to the strong, to those who are mature in their faith, who feel that freedom from the past, to accept the weak. And that word weak means ill or vulnerable. In fact, it appears more than 30 times in the New Testament. I looked at each of those reference, references, and at, in none of those verses, I mean, never, ever, ever, is it used to describe bad character or some sin. It's either referring to a physical infirmity that's left somebody physically depleted, and it's the depletion that that weakness refers to, or it speaks of a spiritual or emotional issue that leaves them spiritually or emotionally depleted or weak. Or another good word might be vulnerable. Judging the opinions then of the weak by those who are strong, who might not have some of those vulnerabilities, is denying them support when they need it most. Jesus has designed the body of Christ, has designed the church to help weak believers grow. Judgmentalism is an attack, an ugly one at that, on how you and I are to function and relate within Christ's body. Having a weakness is not something to be ashamed of. It's just human. A weakness is simply a vulnerability. We all have vulnerabilities. And opinions are a poor standard of judgment for us to place one another under. Now, here's what I mean by that. There are two kinds of level. When you hang a shelf or a frame, there is a, in my opinion, honey, it's level, <laughs> level. And then there is, uh, according to the, the bubble in the middle, the standard, it is level. Now, you know, there are, it's not really that serious of a thing. Not a lot is on the line if uh, a shelf isn't hung exactly level. But there are elements in a building where it is absolutely crucial that they be level. I would like to suggest to you that treating one another with respect is an essential element in the well-being of a believer's life 
and a church's life. Do not use your opinion as your level or standard of how you treat others. Our standard or our level as followers of Jesus is God and his word. Paul gives us the standard in verse 4. Here is the level. God has accepted him. That person you disagree with, God has accepted him. Weak believer, that that older believer that you think is being unreasonable, God's accepted them. If they have come to know Jesus as their Savior, God has accepted them. Older believer, uh, God has accepted that younger believer who seems to have a weakness and is like uh, overreacting and overcompensating. God has accepted them. And so who are you to judge? That's a standard. To his own master he stands or fall, and he will stand. Why? Because the Lord's his master. The Lord is able to make him stand. Oh, this is so huge that you and I use as our standard in relating to one another, especially when we don't agree with each other, the standard of God and his word, and not our opinions. Trusting others. Another thing we have in common when we experience conflict is is trust issues. And we all have them. Trusting others is sometimes hard, especially towards those with whom we disagree. And so verse 5 of Romans 14, Paul says that one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Our opinions will lead us to different conclusions, especially on matters that the Bible does not clearly address. Disputable matters, as some have called them. Others refer to them as gray areas, but our opinions lead us to different conclusions. Think through it for yourself. Paul goes on to add in verse 5, each person must be fully convinced in his mind. You know, you and I, if we've known the Lord for some time, need to establish an ambience in the body of Christ and in the local church where we give room for younger believers or believers with weakness and vulnerability to a particular thing to grow and mature in their thinking. And younger believer, have a will to discern Think for yourself. Listen, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You've been given the mind of Christ. You have the Word of God. Come to figure it out for yourself. Listen to others. Listen to counsel. Talk to people that you respect. But come to the conclusion yourself. Think through it for yourself. Now that's a believer who is able to put trust in its appropriate context. In other words, our ultimate trust Complete, 100% trust is God and His Word, absolutely. But with people, we have to guard our hearts in that trust. And if you're a person who thinks for himself, you're a person that exercises discernment, you're a person who has settled the matter in his own mind, then you're able to handle that trust a lot better. It is the motive that is important. Paul says in verse 6, He who observes the day, observes it for the Lord, and he who, does, who eats does it for the Lord and gives thanks, and he who doesn't does it for the Lord and gives thanks to God. Now they're both doing it for the right reasons. <clears throat> I've seen that so many times over the years where believers of differing opinions will go back and forth, and I'm sitting back thinking after I listen to both sides, they're both doing it for the Lord. They're both doing it for the right motives. Jesus died, and if you have trust issues, then you might assign wrong motives to somebody you disagree with, and it's not even fair. Jesus died and rose for all believers, even the one with whom you disagree. For not one of us lives for himself, not one dies for himself. That's us as Christians. We don't live for ourselves, we don't die for ourselves. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. That's us as Christians. That's our life. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. I think it is Paul's optimistic evaluation regarding the motives of the different believers which stands out to me. He assumes 
that most Christians want to do what is right and do it for the Lord. That's been my experience. I agree with him. And the easy path is to interpret the opinions of others when we don't have the whole story in the worst possible way. Someone doesn't shake your hand at church, well, they must not care about me. No one thanked you for the act of service you did, then that's not good that no one thanked you, but God sees it. But no one thanked you, they must not appreciate me there. The church leader got my child's name wrong. Well, they don't care about me. All of these things are things where we read false motives into somebody else, and those are trust issues. Conflicting opinions. The third thing that we have in common when we experience disagreement is that conflicting opinions are fraught with temptation. You're going to face temptation. Right now, you and I are going through a time of strong opinions and very different opinions, and this is a test, so let's be tested. This is a time of stretching, so let's be stretched. And when we resume, we're going to be tested, and we're going to be stretched over what our real ground of commonness is. Is it our like precious faith? And if it is our like precious faith, then we will relate to each other on that basis of the authority of God's word. Look at what verse 10 says, but you, why do you judge one, your brother? That's one of the temptations to judge. Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? That's another temptation. It's, that's the coming back, the retaliation. I'm, I'm treated with judgment, or at least I perceive judgmentalism, so I retaliate with contempt. Because we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now here's what this passage looks like in the COVID-19 lockdown and coming out of it. Some of us have around us a strong support system. Our families are mostly healthy. We have decent incomes. No one in our immediate family is a terribly high risk. And getting through a couple of months of isolation might stretch us, but we're going to be fine. And so we have an opinion out of that context. Then there are others who are feeling very, very weak right now. Their support system from their kin is more hurtful than helpful, or at least more stressful than helpful. Someone close to them, very close to them, may be of extremely high risk. And maybe money has become a real hardship for them. We share our opinion with each other, the strong and the weak, and we share our opinion about it, and you'll hear others share their opinion, and it's different than yours. And you, strong believer, can I ask you this question? How are you doing in the judgmental department? Are you patient with their fears and their anxieties? Are you willing to come alongside of them and be a support? That's going to be especially true, needed, once we resume services and are no longer under those direct health measures. And how about you who are weak, maybe through no fault of your own? The temptation is to respond with contempt. You know that word contempt <clears throat> means, literally, to make a list. It speaks of holding a grudge, of experiencing an offense, and then keeping it on the list later on. Fraught with temptation. But there is a treasure of such immense value that it takes all of the disagreement about our various opinions and puts it all into perspective. When we give account before Christ at judgment, His grace will overwhelm us with acceptance and approval even though we may fall short. Hmm. And you think about that. He says we will all stand before the judgment seat. That word judgment is the word bema and that's speaking of a judgment that is exclusively for believers. And it is written, Paul says in verse 11, as I live, the Lord says, 
Every knee will bow to me. Every tongue will give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. The Bible tells us about a couple different judgments. Specifically before the throne of God. This judgment is the Bema Seat of Christ. And it's for believers only. Here it is described for you and I in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. Now listen to this closely. He says, If any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, each man's work will become evident for the day, that is the glory of Christ revealed at the Bema Seat, will show it because it will be revealed with the fire of His glory and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If, many, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself, you hear this? He himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Hmm. Some things you and I have done well, and that'll, be, that'll show at the Bema seat. Other things, not so much. Yet the treasure is, we will not be condemned, but welcomed into heaven. How wonderful is that? The fire of Christ's judgment will reveal doubtless many wasted opportunities and selfish motives. But I will be saved from that fire. It won't touch me. Instead, Jesus takes me into heaven where I will worship Him forever. Held accountable, shown to be lacking, and in other ways, receiving a reward, but given grace and mercy for eternity. Psalm 32 puts it well. How sweet it is, how blessed it is, is He whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed, how sweet it is for the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity put onto his count his sin. Why? Because he's put that onto the account of Christ on the cross. The hope of Christian faith is that one day we will each one stand together side by side at the Bema seat of Christ. Our sins will not be held against us. Mercy will be ours. Our brief moments of accountability before Jesus will give way to the privilege of worshiping Him for eternity. There is no greater treasure than to know that your sins are forgiven and you will forever belong to God in eternity. Every single believer in Jesus, even the one with whom you disagree, has that treasure. It is a treasure far more precious than any opinion we might hold on this side of glory. Some good advice I came across recently. A comedian made fun of Representative Dan Crenshaw uh, because he wears an eye patch. And if you haven't, don't know who Dan Crenshaw is, he's a heavily decorated Navy SEAL. When I say heavily decorated, he has a, he has a purple heart, two bronze stars, and a medal of honor. This guy is heavily de de decorated. He's done seven tours of duty. During his third tour of duty as a Navy SEAL, an IED exploded, and he lost his eye in it. Took surgery to repair sight in the other eye. And there, a comedian made fun of him because of that lost eye. And backlash ensued. The comedian apologized. And then a few days later, he took that apology back, saying that network executives made me apologize. But nonetheless, Crenshaw took the high road. He accepted the apology with the honor he's come to be known for. And after he explained why, and I love the advice he gave, try hard not to offend. Try even harder to not be offended. I think we need that today. And I think we need that in the body of Christ. I think that's fantastic advice for you and I when we hold different opinions. As much as in us, let's live at peace with all. Try hard not to offend. And let's try even harder not to be offended. 
Shall we pray? Father, I thank you so very much for your son, the Lord Jesus, who gave himself on the cross, who rose again so that we can have eternal life. I thank you that that is true for every single person who has come to know Jesus Christ, who's put their trust in him, regardless of where they are at in their walk with Christ, whether young or old, weak or strong, even that believer who is judgmental that has put their faith in Christ will be in eternity. And that believer who is easily offended, who responds with contempt too, too quickly, they will be in eternity. And Father, on one level or other, we're, we're, all of us are one of those, if not both at different times. And Father, I confess that to you right now. The times in recent weeks I have allowed whatever to distract me from what's really most important. That's the Bema Seat of Christ. That's you and your word. That's the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Would you help us as we come back together as a church in the not too distant future that we will just rejoice in the like precious faith we have whatever disagreement there might be, that we'll put that aside and that we'll know that we have a a treasure of far greater value of anything in this world. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I, I pray that that would be our heart. And it's in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Scott, for that amazing, 
amazing sermon. It's really great to hear how God is using you every week to give us truth, to teach us things that we sometimes forget or didn't know in the first place, or to be reminded of things or see things in a new light. You know, when I'm looking at Romans 14, I'm just, one of the things that really stood out to me was in uh, verse 4, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? And sometimes I just think through that. You know, when we pass judgment, as Scott was alluding to before, and he's alluded to before in other sermons, we pass judgment based on our opinions, not based on truth, not based on God's word. And I think that's a good reminder. Think twice before passing judgment on others. And why are you doing so? I, I just, I, I'm kind of flabbergasted. It's such, in some ways, it's such a simple little message. It's a simple truth. And something you would almost think is common sense. But I just want to say thank you, Scott, for reminding us how we are to treat one another. And don't pass judgment based on your opinion. And I love how when Pastor Scott shared about Dan Crenshaw, and one of the things he said, and even when someone passes judgment on you or makes fun of you, yes, I know that sometimes we can take things personally, and we've heard the old saying, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a bunch of baloney, isn't it, right? Words do hurt. Sticks and stones hurt too. And sticks and stones hurt temporarily. Words can penetrate. Words can really penetrate. And we take offense to that. But I think a good reminder sometimes is, especially when we're hurt by those who we are closest to, our family and our friends. And back to what Dan Crenshaw said, try hard not to offend. Try even harder not to be offended. That's hard. It's hard not to be offended. It's hard not to take things personally. Even in your own family. We know where to jab sometimes. We know uh, our, our family's weaknesses, our weaknesses. Why do we do that? Because of our opinion. Because of sin. But thanks be to God, who has given us grace, who has given us love, who has given us mercy. I know these times are, are hard. And as we think through what God has done for us, I don't know where you're at. Are you one who judges? Are you one who's been judged and you're having a hard time to forgive? In either camp, in either place, know that God forgives you, that he loves you. If you've been judged, seek in your heart to forgive those, even if they haven't asked for it. Let God do the judging. And if you're one who goes around judging and gossiping, ask and seek for God's forgiveness, and he will give it to you. Know that Christ loves you, and if you haven't placed your faith in Christ, I need you to know that God is good. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, down to this earth so that you could have life, a life without judgment from him. Your sin has already judged you. It is Christ who forgives you. And scriptures are clear. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A very popular verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. He sent his one and only Son, and that whoever believes in him would not perish. If you believe in him, you will never perish. You will have eternal life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for today's message. I thank you for Pastor Scott and the wisdom that you've given him. 
I thank you for your truth as it is a good and regular reminder of what our focus ought to be. And today we learn how our focus ought to be on you and not on passing judgment on others, but to treat each other with respect and kindness and love. And even when we have those weaker brothers and sisters, those vulnerable, weak, or vulnerable brothers and sisters in faith, Lord, we are to stand alongside them and build them up and strengthen them, not tear them down, not pass judgment. Lord, you have given us grace, you have shown us mercy, and you have given us an example of how to treat the world. Help us to be reminded of that. That was Jesus' example for those three, three or so years that he was with his disciples, was to show that example, how you came, so that we could do the same. Lord, if anyone's listening today and doesn't know your name, I pray that they call out to you. I pray that they believe in their heart and confess out loud that you are their Lord. Lord, you know their hearts. Those who are listening to this message know you know their hearts. And if they have confessed to you and believe in you, your name be glorified. Lord, and if there are any here listening who are judging others, especially during this time, we know that that's pretty easy to do. May they seek your forgiveness and focus on what really matters. Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor. You are the King of kings. And you are the Lord of lords. And you are in complete control. May your name be blessed. Amen. Have a great Sunday.